there, gamers, and welcome to the end of the world. Have you ever watched a series like The Walking Dead and wondered how you would do in a zombie apocalypse? Better yet, have you already argued with your friends over who would be the biggest help and the biggest hindrance in an apocalypse-style event at the end of the world? Well, if you have, then Fantasy Flight's The End of the World series might just be for you. Fantasy Flight's The End of the World series is an RPG, similar to that of Dungeons and & Dragons, and it comes in a few flavours. You can get the zombie apocalypse end of the world, the rise of the machines end of the world, or the wrath of the gods. In each one of these games, players will be tasked with their very survival as the world around them collapses into chaos and they are forced to fend for themselves in ever more dire circumstances. What makes this series stand out so much from other games like Dungeons & Dragons is that players are not tasked with creating heroic characters such as elven mages or dwarven warriors in order to get through the adventures in this game. Instead, players are going to play as themselves. That's right, the zombie apocalypse is happening around you and your friends as you are, not as some sort of fantastic hero. So, how would you fare? Before we go on with the video, if you have played Dungeons & Dragons or other RPG games and you are quite familiar with them, then this episode you might want to skip straight ahead to the why you should play this game. Otherwise, I'm going to treat the how-to portion of this video as for players who have never run their own RPG system before. I'm going to go through the general ideas behind being a GM and running a particular game, as well as the minute mechanics of rolling dice and moving the story along. So like I said, if you are familiar with this style of RPG, then skip right ahead to the why you should play this game, and there are many reasons why you should. Otherwise, sit back and enjoy, because we're going to get into how to play this game. For this particular video, I will be sticking with the zombie apocalypse version of this game because that is one that I am familiar with and have played several times with friends of mine. First of all, no, this is not some dodgy copy that I acquired somewhere on the internet. When pre-ordering these games, they actually gave out PDF versions so that you could print them out when the hardcover copies were not available. So my first zombie apocalypse version is in PDF. So let us set the scene. In End of the World Zombie Apocalypse, you and your friends are caught up at the end of the world. Zombies are coming out of the ground and attacking people en masse. You have to escape, survive, get to safety, shelter, otherwise fortify yourselves. Whatever it is, the particular scenario you are going to have your players get into. Which brings us to the GM, or Game Master. Yes, this is an RPG and that means that one of the players will have to sit out as the Game Master of the game. And what does the Game Master do? Well, they are going to create the episode or story that the players are going to follow through and complete over the three or four hours that you will be playing this game. Now this can be part of a wider campaign, the GM's story might go over several nights or even take place over an entire year with players getting together once every month or so to work through the different scenarios towards the main goal of winning the campaign. How does a GM write a scenario for a particular game? Well, it's just like writing a story. You put the players into a particular situation and you move them along the plot of the story from A to B, only you intersperse in this story certain areas where your players need to take actions. Actions that will affect the direction and path they take in the story, or actions like defeating enemy characters. All of this should culminate in some sort of climax at the end where players battle or face some sort of ultimate challenge that either wins or loses them the particular scenario and the night is over. The thing to remember being game master of the game is even though you are in charge of enemy characters such as zombies and things like that, your job is not actually to oppose the other players at the table. You are there to ensure that the players have a good time, that they are adequately challenged and that they enjoy the game. The end of the game, the game master wins if everyone is happy, that doesn't mean you have to go particularly easy on all the characters, and this is a game where it's quite likely that some people may die, or at least be horrifically injured along the way, maybe even turn into zombies. The GM should not be a combative character that is out to defeat the other players at the table, but more of a storyteller and guide. Someone who moves the story along when the players are getting a little bit bogged down in certain things that they don't need to be, and someone who draws it back and creates details in settings. The good thing about the End of the World series for GMs that are new to running RPG games is that it is chock 
full of scenarios already written out for you to follow along. You don't have to follow it along perfectly, but they do have many great ideas and almost full stories taking you through them. For instance, we have Night of the Meteor where the zombie apocalypse comes about because of certain things raining down from the sky. There's No Room in Hell, which is more of a Judgment Day sort of zombie apocalypse. We've got Pandemic and others. And in each one of these scenarios, there are suggested uh, enemy characters and tiles of zombies that you are going to run into like ghoul horses and rat swarms and enemy soldiers there's also areas that it details for you for instance the mall so if you want to put your characters for their particular story inside of a mall uh, then you can have certain scenarios that run like uh, someone suggests sealing up the mall and living inside but there are lots of potential entrances and the team works through whether or not they can survive a night in the mall. Otherwise there are the highway sort of scenarios where you, you and your band are traveling along the highway and each location in the book has a series of suggested events and encounters that could happen during this which really gives a lot of information and a lot of help to the GM in order to make their game. They've got the GM for the game, that they have spent some time reading over the rules, and they have written a scenario that's going to prove to be entertaining and immersive for their players. You've all gotten together, so how do you run the game? The GM will read through the story describing the terrain, the features, and where the characters are in their particular setting. They will stop at certain points and ask the characters what they wish to do for an action. Now, this could be something as simple as you guys have arrived at a refugee camp, what is the first thing that you look for and you do? And you could test whether the players are able to find food, secure friendships with guards, things like that, find equipment. That is a point where the players engage with the story. At other times, you might have a desperate situation where players need to get from one burning building and leap over to the next building where they all have to make a test to see if they can jump across. Other encounters will definitely include zombies and actually fighting off enemy characters. Now these points of the game where the characters are called on to make decisions and see what they would do in certain situations are called performing tasks. In order to perform these tasks, characters need to take a test. So let's see how we run these tests. Basically when they get to a certain point of the story and the character has decided what it is they would like to do, then it should be quite obvious to the character and the GM what characteristic they would need to get this task done. For instance, they might need dexterity in order to fire a weapon and hit a target. They might need persuasion and charisma in order to convince someone to hand over an item that they want. Or they might need a lot of logic to crack a computer code. So the GM will have the final say and determine which characteristic is going to be tested. Each player will have a series of characteristics on their character sheet, which we'll get to later, which will have a certain number next to it. Basically, the higher the number is, the easier it is for that player to perform a task. Now in order to take tests you are going to need to use dice. In the end of the world zombie apocalypse you will need two colored dice sets. One color will represent positive dice and the other color negative dice. A regular game will take about four dice in each pile, anywhere up to eight dice in each pile. The more you have the better, just make sure that they are two very distinct colors. Once a player is ready to take a test, they take a single positive dice. What they're trying to do is to roll the dice and have it match or be under the number next to the characteristic they are using. For instance, if a character had a dexterity of 4, then they would be taking this dice and hoping to roll anywhere from 4, 3, 2 to 1. Those would be successes. 5 and a 6, however, would be a failure. But that's not all. The positive dice represent your character's chances of performing a task successfully. Therefore, you have one for each task that a character needs to do. However, if they have a piece of equipment that is going to help them out, let's say they need to jump across to another building and they have with them a rope with a hook on the end that might help them get across. That adds another positive dice and another chance for success. Something else that might help characters add another positive dice to their role will be certain features that they have. For instance, if they have a few track medals from high school, if they have a long jump championship trophy, that might also help them clear a building. So they add another positive dice to the role. 
If this task was very easy and it wasn't likely to cause the characters much stress of any kind, either mentally or physically, then they would simply roll these dice and see if they were successful or not. <laughs> to be successful, they would have to have at least one of these dice roll the number or under that they require. However, if it's decided by the GM that this particular test might cause them some sort of stress, for instance, jumping over a building, they might sprain their ankle or something when they land. It's a tough situation, so they might add a negative dice. If their building they are jumping from is currently on fire, then they do not have much time and they need to act quickly, which could cause more stress. Maybe they get burnt on the way, maybe they don't time their jump correctly. Finally, like our positive dice, the characters may have equipment or they may have features that negatively affect their ability to perform a task. Now should a character have too much equipment or bulky equipment, like they are carrying a step ladder or something on their back or they have a huge heavy backpack, then that would affect their ability to jump between buildings and you would add a negative dice for that. Perhaps they are the player at the table in your friend group who is super uncoordinated. That might add them a negative dice to roll. At this point, the player and the GM can have a bit of a back and forth here. So the player making a case for other positive things and features and why they should be counted in a certain test, and the GM could put forward or take away positive and negative dice, but the GM is going to have the final say. Once all this is done and everything is agreed on, the player then rolls the dice. The first thing to do once the dice are rolled is to take any matching negative and positive dice and remove them from the pool. For instance, we have two sixes here. They will go away and won't be counted in this test. As you can see, the more negative dice you have, the more likely they are to cancel out positive results. However, in this case, we can see that we still have two positive ones, which are definitely under the four that we needed to roll. We have a negative four and a negative five. So what happens? Well. Our character has successfully made the jump to the other building. In fact, they have done it twice over. So at this point, you could talk to the GM about how you have done something um, extra special if you have had two or more successes. Uh, usually I reserve this for a role where every dice is a success. And then you throw in something like they managed to do a backflip and everyone is impressed and maybe they go up in their charisma, or maybe they are known as the high jump champions and the feature is written down in their list and they get an extra dice every time they come to jumping after that because they had had such great success. Now once it is determined that they have succeeded, you have to deal with the other negative dice still on the table. For each negative dice that did not match a positive dice and get removed, the player will take a stress. The players start the game with so much stress they are able to take in each one of their characteristics. Mental stress, physical stress, social stress. And once they have exceeded all the stress that they are able to take in their character sheet, the player will die. Basically, the stress represents all the cumulative injuries that would happen during the apocalypse that they are trying to live through. For instance, in this role, we are doing a physical test because we are physically jumping. So the player would suffer two stress. Now, should the player suffer three stress or more, they might have to take an injury or trauma, something that will actually hinder them as they go forward in the game. The more stress and the more injuries they take throughout the game, the more negative dice they will have to face and the more likely they are to be taken out or killed during their attempt at surviving the zombie apocalypse. So stress is something that you're gonna to have to keep an eye on throughout the game. But basically that is a test. Each time a player is called on or decides themselves that they would like to complete a task, then it is up to them and the GM to decide which dice are what they need. They roll the dice to see if they are successful or not and that affects the story that the GM goes on. All of characters having done a particular test from a particular area then the GM goes through the story again until they get to the next section where they'll be called on to complete tests and tasks. The same thing goes for fight sequences. Should players come across zombies, they might want to attack and defeat these zombies. They might be helped by a weapon that they have, such as a pitchfork or a machete or something like that. And they might be trained in using a particular weapon and be very good at it. But 
they might be fighting in the dark, which could be a negative factor, and they might be fighting with a sprained wrist for something else that happened during the game or that the character has. They roll the dice, and for every success, they cause stress and harm on the zombie. The zombie takes stress just like they do, and when it gets to a certain level, it will be injured or dead. Now, for small characters like zombies and stuff, you don't have to count how many broken toes or feet or arms a zombie has. Just skip all that stuff until you get to the point where the zombie dies. Likewise, when the non-playable characters are attacking the players, they will take dice decided by the GM for how they attack. They might be slow, Day of the Dead style zombies that just get a single swipe or bite at you, or they might be a lot faster and scarier zombies that need two dice. They might be attacking you by surprise and get another positive dice, but they might be fighting in an area where there's fire or something thing that they might fall over so they roll dice positive and negative just like the players do suffering stress and dealing out stress as damage while the character sheets have how much stress and trauma a character can take until they die written on them the GM will decide for themselves how much stress particular non-playable characters have before they die. If you're fighting against a zombie, then you don't want them to go forever and ever like an end boss, so you might just give them three stress until they're dead. If it is something bigger, like a zombie ghoul horse, you might give them six stress. If they are an evil soldier or a, some sort of human, some sort of boss character that the players would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with, then you would give them the same level of stress stress as characters have in the game. Ultimately, it's up to the GM and it's up to the flow of the game. Should the players have a lot of trouble with the first opponents that you gave them in the opening sequence of the game, perhaps you would like to dial down the stress that other characters have later in the game. Likewise, if they are floating through the game too easily, the GM can make the other characters a little bit more difficult as the game progresses. The End of the World series is designed to be very fluid. The GM is ultimately in charge and you can adjust as you go if you need to. Don't feel locked into what you have pre-prepared for the game. So now that you know how the tests run in the game and what you will be looking at as far as characteristics and dice rolls go, let's go through the character creation themselves. This is a whole different part of the game itself and it can be just as much fun as playing the game honestly, so let's go through it in a bit of detail. Each player is going to require one of these character sheets. They chuck their name at the top. Remember they are playing as themselves. The first thing they're going to have to do is fill out the characteristic portions of the sheet. You can see here physical, mental and social. These are the three different characteristic categories. And underneath these, we have two different kinds. We have dexterity and vitality for physical, logic and willpower for mental, and we have charisma and empathy for social. Now underneath these, you will notice a little sword under dexterity, a shield under vitality, and likewise for the others in the group. What that basically means is that these characteristics will be used largely in offensive things, things that you are trying to achieve if they've got the sword on it, or if you are being attacked or inconvenienced by something, someone is trying to get the better of you, then you will use your defensive one. These little numbers go up from one to five. So let's go through first what the categories are. Dexterity is your character's ability to use things and manipulate objects. It's your hand-eye coordination. So when you are making attacks, when you are firing weapons, when you're running along boards and, and on top of cars, you'll need to use your dexterity. Vitality is your character's strength and stamina. If you need to run long distances, if you need to lift things like a car, that is the one that you will use. Logic is your character's ability to think fast and think on their feet. If you are hacking into computers or you are solving some sort of tactical situation, you will use your logic. Willpower is more your mental resistance and your ability to remember things. Should you need to remember something that a character mentioned earlier in the game? Should you need to recall a password? Should you need to resist mental traumas or interrogations? You will use your willpower. Charisma is your ability to turn people to your point of view in social situations. Do you need to convince guards to let you go? Do you need to convince other survivors to hand over important equipment or supplies to you? You'll be relying on your charisma to do so. Empathy is your character's ability to understand where other people are coming from and put yourself in their shoes. Now this could be handy if you are trying to detect whether or not someone is lying to you or whether or not someone is likely to turn on you 
So empathy is a good defensive one to have. All players will start at level 1 for each of these characteristics and they will get 10 points to use. They use their points by using one point for every one number they are going to move up a particular characteristic. For instance, if you're someone with great hand-eye coordination, you will want to move up your dexterity. So if you went to dexterity 2, you would lose one point. Dexterity 3, you would pay two points. Four, three points, five, four points. And basically remember that when you do a test, your test is against these characteristics and you pass these tests by rolling the number or under. As you can see, you don't have enough points to boost every single one of these up into the high range, which makes it likely for you to succeed in a roll. So you have to pick and choose what areas you are going to be strong in and what areas you're going to be weak. Give the players some time at the start of the first game that you play to go through this and allocate their points. Now it is important to be honest with yourself at this particular point. Because what is going to happen once you have finished spending all of your characteristic points is that the rest of the table is going to get a vote as to whether you are being honest or not. Now there's several different ways to do this. There is a blind vote in the book. But I find the easiest way is to just have the players one at a time show the other players their characteristic sheet. Other players at the table will get a vote for one of each of the characteristics. First the physical, then the mental, then the social. Basically the characters will go through the numbers that the player has put down and either say they agree with the numbers that are there, no they do not agree with the numbers, and one of two things will happen. Either the players will decide that a player has been a little bit generous with their dexterity for instance, and if all the players vote to disagree, when this happens the player chooses either one of the physical traits to lower by one point. They will do the same thing for mental, they will do the same thing for social. Players can also decide that another player has been too hard on themselves and they do not have such a low logic for instance and they will say they deserve to go up a point. Once this is done the player will choose either willpower or logic in the mental capacity and they will boost those by one. This is why it is good to be honest at this point of the game because while this is a lot of fun, it can really drag on if every single player has gone to ridiculous lengths to give themselves an amazing feature which they don't really have. And then you're stuck with a game where everyone downvotes and upvotes things, whereas if they are very honest and truthful and, and just get through this quick and easy, then you move on to the next part of character creation nice and fast. Now the next part of the character sheet are the features. Now in each category, physical, mental and social, a player is required to put down one positive feature about themselves and one negative feature about themselves. Just like the dice we talked about before, every single player is going to have one physical attribute that would be a positive and one physical attribute that would be a negative. Same for mental, same for social. For instance, from a previous game, one of the characters put down mental characteristic features as book smart for their positive feature which will help them in certain situations but they are also easily influenced so they can easily doubt whether they are right or not which will negatively affect their mental abilities during the game. Another player in physical has put down that they are very strong and can lift heavy weights for a positive feature in the physical section. However, they have terrible knees, which often give out. So that is a negative feature if they are required to use their legs in any sort of feat of strength during the game. One positive, one negative feature, and you guys are ready to play, except for the voting section that we just went over. If your characters have raised one of your characteristics, so they have decided that you were too mean to yourself on physical and they made you go from dexterity 3 to dexterity 4, then you technically have spent one extra point from the 10 that you had at the start of the game. So in order to combat this, you add one extra negative feature to whichever section you were boosted up a point. Likewise, if you were taken down a point because the other players at the table thought you were being too generous, for every section that you have gone down a point, you must add one positive feature to that section because you would be now less than the 10 points you originally spent. All of that being done, you are down to the equipment section of your list. In your very first game, it is likely that your players will be caught off guard by the zombie apocalypse and you will only be able to use equipment that you can find on hand. Likewise, for the rest of the game, you want your equipment to be realistic. Things that you could actually find, things that you could actually use, and things that you can actually 
carry. That being said, it is really easy. We're not coming up with any fantastical equipment here. If you have a first aid kit in the house, some bandages, some rope, anything like that, write them down. And like we saw with the dice, these can positively or negatively influence rolls as they go along. Remember not to overpack, however, because we talked about how carrying too much stuff can have negative effects on your rolls. And also, you'll be picking up stuff as the story progresses from other locations, so you need to have enough room to carry this stuff. So let's get to the stress track. All the stress that your character is going to take is going to happen in one of these three categories, mental, physical, or social. And we can see down here, the stress track starts at the bottom with level one. Each time you suffer a stress, you'll fill in one of these squares and you'll go up as you go along. Should your stress track get to nine out of nine, that is all the stress that you can take and your character has died. Either they have suffered a physical death they might have had a mental breakdown and are a gibbering mess and cannot go on, or they might have been so socially isolated that they are forced to wander alone and no longer take part in the activities of the group. Now the numbers on the side of your stress track are not just there for show. What they represent is your resistance. As you go along getting stressed out by certain things in the zombie apocalypse, by injuries such as cuts, bruises, sores in the physical category, you also become more resistant to the same kinds of damage. So as you go up in stress, you acquire resistance equal to the amount of tears that you have already filled in. For instance, if you have suffered four stress, then you fill in the first tier three here and you go up to the next tier and fill in one. Now if you are going to be stressed again by another event later in the game and say it causes you two stress, well you've already filled in one column of stress therefore you have become more immune to that stress so you would reduce the amount of stress you take by one. Therefore if you've suffered two stress then you would only suffer one stress by this particular event. If you have seven stress and you fall off a roof of a building and land hard and you suffer three stress as a result, well, you have one, two tiers filled in, which means your resistance is two. So instead of taking three stress, you only take one more. However, that is really close to death. So you might want to get rid of some of that stress and you can do this with traumas. Now, traumas are acquired during the game against special enemies that might cause traumas along with the attacks that they make. However, there's another way to get traumas through in the game, and that is to convert the stress that you have taken into a trauma. Now, this represents your character taking time out to look after injuries that they have suffered or stress that they are under. Basically, the player will have to take five, five minutes out of the game where they won't be any help to anyone else. They won't be able to throw in if there is an attack or elsewise. They are busy dealing with their injuries. Once they have taken this time out, as it were, then the player can remove all of the stress from a single characteristic of their character. They convert this instead into one trauma and these trauma level is the same as the amount of tears that they have cleared off in order to convert it into a trauma. For instance, if they had three stress and they wanted to get rid of it so they don't suffer from it later in the game, they clear that three stress and is a level one trauma. If there was a physical level one trauma, then we might have something like a twisted ankle or a first degree burn. If, however, they were all the way up at eight, they were almost dead from the attacks that they had taken, they take the time out and they convert a level three trauma to their character. Now this could be a broken leg, this could be blindness, this could be a much more severe injury. Other traumas like mental might, mental traumas might turn into phobias or fears or anxiety. Social traumas might turn into apathy or dissociation from the group. These traumas are going to affect your character and affect their ability to complete tasks. Obviously, twisted ankles are going to become a feature that are going to negatively affect physical tests that are done. But you will save your character from having all of their stress done and dying in the game. Now, traumas themselves can be treated, but they take a much longer time to get rid of. For instance, if you are going to treat a broken leg, your character might have to sit out for a week. That's not too bad if the trauma was suffered at the end of a game and you guys don't get together for another game until a month later, and you might be able to get rid of it then. But it often means that players are stuck with their traumas that they accumulate for the rest of the game they are in at least. Other things might take months, or there might be some traumas like losing a limb or an ear that just cannot be fixed and become part of your character. 
If you decide to get rid of a trauma and you find you have the time to do so, then you do this by making a roll against the characteristic that you have the trauma in. You choose the defensive characteristic, vitality for instance, for the physical side, and you roll against it once again using positive and negative dice. Positive dice can be added for equipment and first aid, whatever you might have around, and also helpful teammates that might help you, finding a hospital, might help for physical traumas. Negative dice will be added for interruptions, uh, constant zombie attacks, uh, unsanitary conditions, things like that. Do the roll off. If you succeed, then the trauma is reduced by one level of severity. If the severity level is reduced to zero, then the trauma is just gone, but a level three broken leg might go to a level two healing leg. It's slightly better, it's not gonna affect you as badly. Also, once again, negative dice will cause you stress. The last thing I'm gonna talk about is weapons and armor. Of course, there are zombies to deal with and potentially dangerous survivors as well. Certain weapons in the game will provide advantages like we already discussed, adding positive dice if you have the right weapon for the right job, but certain weapons will also cause extra damage. For instance, a knife or a machete might cause three damage for every successful roll that you do. A shotgun would of course do much more, an automatic rifle if you somehow manage to find one of those. So when you are causing stress to your zombie opponents, don't just count one successful positive dice as one stress, but check the weapon being used and times the amount of stress by the weapon's damage. You'll find this in the rulebook. Likewise, you can find certain types of armor that can help you resist stress or damage. Now, this will only be physical stress, of course, as a firefighting outfit is not going to stop you suffering mental or social stress, but it might be able to help you from a zombie's long nails. Normal clothing won't give you any sort of bonus. A couple of examples would be a firefighting outfit or bulletproof vest might give them plus one resistance, which means they suffer one less stress from a physical attack. Otherwise, a full bulletproof bodysuit or a medieval suit of armor, wherever you might find that, will give them plus two resistance. Now, keep in mind, these are just from attacks, as a bulletproof suit of armor is not going to save you from suffering physical stress if you fall off a building but it might save you from being stressed when you are hit with a club. So there you have it, Game Masters. You are ready to play your first game of End of the World Zombie Apocalypse. But why should you play this game? I can tell you from personal experience that this game has been some of the most imaginative and fun gameplay that I have had with my group of friends ever playing any sort of board game. And we've played lots of board games, and we've also played Dungeons and Dragons once or twice as well, but playing this game is truly something else. The players on the night are playing as themselves, and a creative GM can really have fun with this. Creating scenarios that will point out character flaws or decision-making paradoxes or start arguments amongst a group, because they know what the players are like and what they will agree and argue about. What I would suggest in putting this game together is to play it very, very loose. Get yourself a story where you can get from A to B a number of ways because the players around you playing themselves will have lots of strange ideas and you don't want to be caught up where you cannot go on with the story because nobody wants to go the direction you want to go and you want to keep it very, very fluid. The first time I played this game, I set it up as with one of the examples in the book where people actually showed up to the house to play a game of zombie apocalypse only to find out that the zombie apocalypse was actually happening outside. Players in that particular game started off by choosing their characteristics and getting their character cards sorted, and then I literally gave the characters 10 minutes to run around the house and search it for equipment that they could equip themselves with for the zombie apocalypse. We had people running out to my garage picking up chainsaws and pitchforks, other people picking up lamp posts and covering themselves in old coats for suits of armor, and it was hilarious. Then they had to try and keep the zombies out and survive a night. They were deciding where they were going to put couches against windows and things. Other people failed all their 
their rolls to barricade windows and they got yelled at because everyone else managed to do it and they stuffed up and the zombies got in. It was a lot of fun. And it's a great game to play with your quirky friends that are a little bit subversive too and have fun with that. For instance, our friends then escaped in a later game to Sydney Harbour where they got on a refugee ferry and had a choice of anything they wanted to do. So one of my friends decided to start a one-man comedy music routine in order to boost morale on the ship. Of course, you could be one of those GMs that says that's a ridiculous idea that is going nowhere and you're just trying to be a pain, or you could just let them roll a test. Once he actually rolled his test and it was super successful, then we wrote into the story that some of the passengers were so impressed that they shared rations and equipment that they had spare in order to pay him for his services. Another great thing about being GM in this game is do your friends have irrational fears about something? Add it into the game. Do they hate seagulls and birds? Well, make them go to a harbour where there are zombie seagulls and other birds and make them face that. It causes so much hilarity and so much visceral reaction when the players are playing the game. And you can really play true to the characters and personalities that are there with you at the table. It is the kind of game that if you get right, your friends will talk about for months afterwards. There is laughter, there is shouting, there are great wins and there are terrible lows and they all happen in your friend group playing as your friend group. It also turns the friend group on its head as only a role-playing game can do. Shy and reserved members of the group may turn out to be crack shots and positively deadly in combat, whereas the super blustering and confident members of your group might keep failing their roles and become a massive hindrance and a laughing stock to the rest of the group, all depending on the roll of the dice. It makes for great gameplay, it makes for great storytelling, win, lose, die, turn into zombies, Everyone has a good time. If you have played RPGs like D&D before, then I can highly recommend Fantasy Flight's The End of the World for you. Thank you very much for tuning in, players. Subscribe to hear more how-tos and hopefully some Let's Plays very soon. Let us know in the comments if there is a particular game you would like us to go through or play through. And otherwise, enjoy the end of the world.